everyone. Uh, it's nine o'clock, so we're going to get things kicked off. My name is John Scheidmeyer. Uh, I'm an engineer for Teradata. I work on the listener product. And uh, before we get too far, a couple housekeeping items. If you would remember to please silence your phones, that'd be good. If you have to take a call, please go outside and keep note of the, the exits in case something bad happens. So thank you for joining me today um, to talk about from CRM to HRM, Vodafone's way uh, to household relationship management. Our speaker today is Dr. Stefan Schwartz. Um, he's an industry consultant for Teradata. He, his past experiences include uh, telcos and consultings in, in a variety of uh, industries, or sorry, businesses. Um, Stefan has spent his whole career in data warehousing um, and always on the business side. He has a keen interest in um, the analytics and, and kind of the associated logistics. And when he works with his clients, uh, he's very interested more so in the use cases and in the value of those use cases and, and less around the technology. So with that said, I will turn it over to Stefan. Thank you, sir. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as John said, uh, the title of the presentation is from CRM to, to HRM. Um, and I think uh, some of the operators are still on their way to CRM, and uh, Vodafone is now trying to do the next step. And this whole presentation talks about uh, why they want to go this way, um, what is the benefit of going this way, also financially, and then uh, a little bit of uh, what could be then the next step after HRM. Um, before I jump into the presentation, I would like to say thank you. Um, um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for your attendance here at nine o'clock in the morning and, uh, and also in this very remote um, room. So thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to thank you um, uh, Ole Schatz, who is uh, well, supposed, was supposed to be my um, co-presenter or wanted to present with me. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it um, due to some last-minute changes of his schedule. So, um, but he is with us uh, virtually. So, Ole, wherever you are, um, it's good to have you here at least virtually. So let's uh, go into. Um, what, we, what I want to talk about a little bit in, in more detail. So first of all, as in all presentation, I would like to introduce Vodafone a little bit. I kept this to one slide. It's almost impossible to talk about Vodafone on one slide, but I'll try anyway. And then I'll talk about a little bit about the evolution from CRM to HRM, the reasons why. I will talk about the results. You could also say I talk about money, money, money. Is wh why, why are we doing that? And then I talk a little bit about the high-level methodology. So how have we done it? What was the success? What was the critical success factors? These kind of topics. And in the end, I have, again, one slide that says, don't do this, but do this. This is our learnings, basically, from the project. I'm with Vodafone. Um, I'm working with Vodafone now for three, four years, very intensively with Ola. And, um, we have done a couple of projects, but this is probably one of the most successful ones that we have done. So uh, this is Vodafone. Vodafone has something like 30 plus uh, what they call opcos, operating companies. They have another f um, additional footprint of 50 plus uh, partner markets. So you can say they are present in, in more than 80 countries uh, around the globe. And um, they have... Uh, uh, 450 million customers, uh, some more, some less, and also they are, have uh, something like 90,000 employees. So what this slide should bring across is basically it's a very complex organization. It's a very big organization, a very powerful organization. If they want something, they can really, really do it. Um, but it's also creating some complexity. <coughs> and this is the environment, just to give you a little bit the environment that we're working in. So, so much about Vodafone. 
The next thing I would like to do is um, to talk a little bit about what is it? What is household relationship management? And uh, I would like to start with a question. So who of you flew into Atlanta? Didn't come by car, but by plane. Who was it? Quite some people. So who of these people basically had a central seat or a middle seat in the plane? Oh, 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 oh okay. Some more people, uh, some, some, uh, some fewer people. And uh, this happened to me, when I travel a little bit more, this happened to me every now and then, right? And for me, it's a real nightmare, right? Sitting in the middle of a, of a, of a row, basically, and then there, is, then there is two people, one is snoring, the other is watching TV, and uh, you're trying to sleep. So that's, uh, that's the situation. <coughs> and obviously, I always try to see something good in everything, right? But what can you see good in this picture? And I thought about the, the concept of six degrees of separation. Just a short summary of this concept. Well, in six steps within your social environment, you know everybody on this planet. So th within six steps, you know Barack Obama. Within six other steps, you probably know Vladimir Putin, just to have the two uh, ends of the scale, so to say. <laughs> and what does this mean for my example? Right, if you, if you uh, look at this, basically, there will be a significant number of Vodafone customers on the plane. And from a marketing perspective, you could originally talk to these customers, right? These are your customers. They are in your base. You can talk to them and you can market to them. But what you can do if you talk about social networks and if you talk about communities and in particular, you look on households, you can market to the whole plane. Right? And getting in contact with people on the plane gives you a much broader audience than just your own customers. From a marketeer's point of view, this is a big improvement because his customer base indirectly gets much bigger and he can market to many, uh, much, uh, many more people. So, but how does Vodafone know how to do that? How do they do it? How do they know basically um, whom to ap um, approach for what kind of topic, um, whom to approach within a certain community, within a household? How do they know? First of all, let me talk a little bit about the concept, about the way from CRM to HRM. So this is a little bit a historical view on uh, how marketing or below the line marketing in particular developed uh, Intel cooperators. In the very old good times basically where everybody who had a mobile phone only had one single separated isolated phone, most of the time such a brick that you carry around with you, life was very easy, right? They could market to contracts not to customers, they simply market to contracts. It was good enough, right? And very simple. You have a contract with a person, you send him an email, and he's buying another brick. Very easy. But obviously the situation changed a little bit, and uh, you simply, uh, th you had people with two contracts, and suddenly you were sending him confusing messages. Um, so they had to change the concept. And they came to something that is called bond view. So billing account number view. So what they did then is they marketed to bills. So there could be more than one product on a bill, more than one contract on a bill. And obviously this concept got out of fashion or out of reality uh, very soon as well. Because then had people with two bills and then again you're sending confusing messages. And then they tried to establish a person view. This is a CRM concept. Uh, you market to a person with several billing accounts, with several handsets, with several tariffs. Um, and this is basically more or less where the majority of the operators are today. They market to customers. Is this, uh, are they really perfect in doing that? Probably not, but uh, they, are they have a decent, they have a decent uh, level of quality in, that, um, in the meantime. 
But when I ask you basically what is the, um, what is a golden calf or um, what is basically one of the biggest things that telco currently do in order to meet that challenges? So, so give, me some, give me some ideas. What is the biggest things that uh, telcos, the holy grail of the telco industries? Give me some examples. Huh? Churn? Yes, that's true. But more in terms of what they do, not the what. Sorry? Yep, that's correct. Yes, okay. Um, upselling, yes. Yeah, but that is all on mobile, right? <coughs> Additionally, what they do, they have some problems of extending their revenues and they want to talk to more customers and they want to be, become bigger. And in the mobile space, this has a certain limit. So what they, try and what they try to do and what they did over the last period of time, they bought other line of, lines of business, right? So Vodafone, for example, bought Germany's biggest cable operator. They bought a DSL business. And now they're adding up lines of business. And again, they're running into problems in marketing because exactly because of that. Suddenly, they have household products. So a cable product is not only being used by one person in the household, it's used by the whole household, right? With totally different usage profiles, totally different interests between the kids and the father and the mother. They all use it differently. And you have to accommodate their, their different interests. And if you market to a single person, this is impossible. Because just imagine uh, the value tiers they're in. If the family is in different value tiers, you're sending totally different messages to the same household. And obviously in the household, most of the households, they families, they talk to each other. Huh? And then uh, just imagine the confusing messages and how they're being discussed in the household. It's a mess. So what they have to do basically, all the operators have to do, and I think Vodafone is a little bit on the forerun with that, they need to change to a household view, to market to a household. Consistent messages, good messages to the household. And this is uh, what this presentation is all about. And this is what it means from a, from a kind of a data and analytics perspective. So contract is very easy. It's a fact. It's in your database. You can just read it, and it's fact-based. Barn is also kind of fact-based. A billing system holds a lot of the information that you need in order to talk to these people. When a person comes, there's a lot of facts, but there's also some propensity models um, that bring bills together for one person. And then in the household. The household is purely propensity-based. Building a household, you can only rely on propensity in most of the markets. There's very few markets where the data quality in your operational system, where the data exists, and the data quality is good enough, basically, to just take it from the database. I, I rarely know any operator who can do that, and I, I've seen a couple of dozen in my Teradata career. So, <coughs> So you have to build a propensity model in order to come up with how information. And the next step, and Vodafone is not quite there, is then to identify hidden household members. What do I mean with hidden household members? So the household you build on propensity models, this is only your customers. But you, you find out which of your customers live in the same household. This is step number four. If you talk about hidden household members, these are non-customers. So the customers mainly of your competition, mainly customers of your competition. But obviously, remember my plane example? You also want to talk to them. You're not allowed in most countries to talk to them directly, but you have your sales agent, your customers within the household. So really, they want to use their customers in the different households to also talk to the complete household and offer, obviously, products that bring them over to Vodafone and make uh, the household a Vodafone household, a real, complete Vodafone household. This has some legal restrictions, um, which, uh, which I think the model that we built uh, obeys the, even the German legal restrictions, and Germany is probably the worst place on earth in terms of privacy regulations. But also, it has to <coughs> accommodate the, um, I would call it, ethical standards of Vodafone, right? I, even if it's illegal, it has to have a certain ethical attitude. And this is what we are still discussing and fine-tuning. 
So it's not live, it's not operational, and we'll not bring it live until we have a very safe and very, um, very legal and very ethical approach for our customers. So, and this is what, what will change, right? We come from a barn view, basically, of the household. So different customers with different products seen in isolation to a household view where you still have, in the beginning, the same products, the same people, but you know they belong together and they interact with, with each other. And they have household needs instead of isolated, separate needs for each person. Oops, back again. So before I come to the point of how we have done it, I would like to show you what this financially means in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, some key KPIs that Vodafone looked at. So what are the kinds of um, improvement areas that Vodafone was looking at? Obviously, this concept allows to develop your customer in, in two different dimensions, and it allows to retain customer. When you look at um, developing customer, obviously there is a good opportunity to add additional customers to your, uh, to, to acquire new contracts within the household, so to say, to bring more people of the household basically into your customer base. And you can add additional products that are household specific to the mix that will increase um, the value of the customers, of your already existing customers in the household. It's a, a very big opportunity, by the way, and we'll come to that a little bit later on. And obviously, this also increases the loyalty or the retention capabilities of Vodafone. If you bundle a lot of things into one contract across a different line of business, so your cable product, your broadband cover, your entertainment products, your mobile products, all your mobiles, prepay, postpay, everything into one legal construct, one contract, so to say. It's very hard to go away from that, right? If you cancel that contract, you are in a lot of hassle. You, you are in the middle of trying to move everything to somewhere to the competition, and this reduces churn significantly. I'll show you some numbers on that. Obviously, um, this is a little bit on, on how you increase um, the penetration within, within our household and um, increase the revenue by that. And um, obviously this is about uh, quad play, real quad play offers, or uh, to use a more recent term, converged offers. Um, this is address all members within the household. We talked about this a little bit earlier. And it's about increasing the value of the contract. And the, here are some numbers. So let's first talk about the churn. What you see on the, this is your left hand side, uh, you see the, di the churn differential. So the green line is a simple customer level churn. And the black line, brown line, whatever it is, <coughs> the one below, this is a household churn. So a customer churning from a household um, contract. The churn differential is 43%. I've rarely seen any initiative that brings a churn reduction of 43%. Right? It's early days, I agree, but 43% is significant. And uh, I think uh, some of you work for telcos. If you could reduce your churn by 43%, I think you can calculate your same what this means in terms of business cases and so forth. This is really, really good. Second effect is uh, the intra-household influence. So what we measured was basically how many of the household members visit a store afterwards. And you have to, and it's just one example, call the call center, go online, you could measure all this. Uh, and you see uh, the, the light blue um, column is basically the contacted customer. So the customer we directly spoke to. And you see contact rate. Um, so how many, uh, so many customers responded within two weeks and came to a, came to a shop and bought something probably. And then you, had, uh, uh, then, you have, um, then you have people who are not your customers, but responded to the same campaign. So that shows that it works. In some cases, it works. You simply talk to your customers, they talk to their 
wives, brothers, sisters, so other members of the household, and those people come to the shop. This is something where you significantly in, um, increase your household influence, and in the end, basically, your household revenue. The next thing is uh, the consectable potential. So there are cases where somebody that I contact within a household cannot influence the others. So for example, in my case, if I tell my wife you have to go to Vodafone or you have to go to uh, some other operator, she would still say, why? <laughs> why? Just because you say so? Um, this is probably uh, the example on the other side, right? But if you, <coughs> uh, there are some people basically who you can, who, who have a certain influence on their family and this is, uh, I think in, in one out of three cases, this is the case. And they can really influence the other members of the household and um, uh, they, they really get a contact with, a, with the other household members through the person. So, after I show you some results, obviously ca I cannot show like revenue numbers or something, but I think from these numbers it's quite easy to calculate your own case. So how did we do it? Um, the first step, the first step is on this slide. The first step is a fuzzy match. Within this first step, you have another four steps, <laughs> basically, and um, you see on the left-hand side, you see the data acquisition. So what went into it was initially prepay, postpay, uh, fixed net and cable, um, and fixed uh, DSL, obviously, fixed net DSL. So fixed net telephony and broadband and cable products and the, the two um, sorts of mobile. And then basically the, the, the very first step is you have to normalize the data because data normally with any mobile operator in the world, if you take it from an operational system, it's a mess, right? There's different spelling, different structures, different, different everything. And you have to normalize it. In Germany, you get rid of certain characters so that nobody else knows. Basically, you need to you get, a, get away from abbreviations of um, data in the wrong field and these kind of things, right? Street number is something and uh, uh, that, that often you find in the street name itself or in, in a totally different field, th things like that. So you normalize it. The very important fact here is you also keep the unnormalized data because in the end you want to see how successful the whole process is. And the only chance you really have is to have a human looking onto the data and find out if the things that the algorithm basically produced does make sense. Because the human eye can clearly, or in many cases, see if two persons are the same, if the address is somehow similar, if it makes sense that this is one person, one household. And therefore you need to keep the original information because otherwise you throw away a lot of useful stuff that you as a human can understand but it's not very useful for uh, an algorithm. <coughs> and then the most important uh, step, obviously, the matching process. The first part of the matching process is very easy. It's given links. So for example, for certain products within Vodafone, you can run into a shop and say, I want the family package. And by the way, this billing, this bill and this bill belong to the same person, to the same household, to the same community, friends and whatever and they put it into the system and it's a hard link between two accounts. That is obviously something that you can very easily use. There was some discussion around it, can we really use it because you have the self optimizers that really say this is my friend although, although he isn't, uh, this is my family although he isn't, right? Just because he saves five euros on, on average, something like that. But what we find out basically it works quite well. So Vodafone customers are very honest was not a new fact, but at least we proved the fact that they are very honest. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and uh, then there is uh, the second step of the matching process is the one that really makes a difference. There you take combination of the different data fields and apply certain distance metrics. So you try to calculate how far away is the street name and the address or the name and the billing account number or the, the, the account number, the banking account number, these combinations, how far are they away uh, for the two data sets that you compare? And obviously you have to have different um, um, metrics for the different distances. And the most important thing is also to play around and fine tune 
the minimum level of accuracy for these matches. Um, so how correct does a bank account number have to match the other bank account number? Obviously, this is close to 100% because bank account numbers are very... But the street address and the first name, uh, there's different spelling sometimes, different spelling of names and things like that. Probably not 100%, but probably 70% or something like 70% of the name or at least the first letter. Some, some people abbreviate their first name. So the first letter has to match these kind of things. And we played around very intensively with all these parameters. And in the end, basically, this matching process was able to match something like 80 plus percent of the, uh, of the records correctly, which is something that uh, took a lot of effort, basically, to bring it to that quality level. And then another uh, important step uh, 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 has to take place. You have to build history. Sounds very easy, right? You just store data over time, that's the history. But what you shouldn't do, you should not change the parameters too often because otherwise you destroy the history. If you just change the parameters slightly, you break up households, you combine other households, and your complete history is uh, down the drain, um, to say it very precisely. And uh, the other thing is, if uh, then you have to look into what happens to households, right? There's, there's things that can happen to a household that cannot happen to a single customer. Households break up. So for example, uh, the, the easiest uh, example is kid goes to university, moves into another town, um, and he creates a separate household. That's an easy case. Relationships break up, and they both move somewhere else. Which household ID do you keep? And which household ID do you create new? Then people move together, right? It's probably the more positive example. Um, what happened to the two household IDs, right? Uh, and uh, who is the dominant household ID? Um, this is something I didn't discuss with my wife as well. So. Um, this is uh, all examples, and you have to have, I think the most important thing is you have to have clear rules, and you have to stick to the rules, because otherwise you destroy history, and we all know how important history is, is to analyze um, uh, the data. So this is the first step. As I said, this slide is the first step and a very important step towards household relationship management. And this is kind of the uh, result. But uh, you see uh, parts of your uh, base uh, is, a, uh, one uh, is a one product is a one product base. These are this one, this one, and this one. This one have only mobile products. This one have only cable products, and this one have uh, only uh, DSL products. And this is a big opportunity, because what you obviously want to do is to bring them into the lower boxes on the right hand side, right? Two product household, three product household. And, and bring them there. There's even some surprise in there. So there are households that have a cable product and a DSL product. For most cases, I couldn't really find out what that, why that makes sense because the cable product in Germany always comes as a broadband connection, all right? What for do you need the DSL, right? Obviously, there are some cases where the DSL is, is used for business and uh, the, the cable product is used for private use, but in the end, <laughs> I, I, I don't really understand, but these uh, segments exist. And then the next step. Let's come to the next step. We use SNA, as I said before, in order to identify hidden household members. And how does this work? So what may surprise one or the other, and probably some others not, the telephony, f um, the tele how people talk to each other over the telephone is totally different to whom I talk. And especially you can come up with three big you talk to your family members, you talk to your friends, and you talk to uh, business, right? A uh, business telephony. In Germany, it's different. This is everywhere in the world. You have these three segments. In Germany, you have you have one more. Uh, and this gave us a really hard time within the project. But in Germany, people have also business friends. These are friends that you that you got to know. Well at your workplace, and you get to know him better, and you have a significantly different telephony 
um, you talk to these people very differently, different time, different lengths of call, different location um, than with your real friends. So then when we created the force um, cluster, it all came into play. So you have here the clusters, two examples, one is friends and one is family. You can see the cells that they use, where, uh, whom they talk to, how long they talk, what time of the day, off peak, on peak. And if you bring everything into the equation, you can very clearly identify what this, uh, who talks within this uh, conversation. Is it family, is it friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and then we look at, obviously all segments are, have some uh, relevance, but we, in this case, we only looked at the family, family segment because this is closest to the household, really. Uh, usually a family lives in one household. There are some, ex some exceptions, but um, this is closest. And then we created triangles of people that are in this segment. So people that talk to each other, we put into a triangle. And then you have um, triangles that are purely on it. So everybody on a Vodafone network, and there is not much you can do about it, right? Th that's your desired state. But then you, have p uh, then you have triangles where two are on the Vodafone network and one is uh, off net. So with, uh, in Germany with Deutsche Telekom or O2. And these is, are your targets, right? These are the hidden household members. They are part of the family, they are part of the household, and they are on a competitor network. Right? This is the one you want to target. And you can target them because you can speak to your customers in the household to bring them on board. And this is, this is the trick, so to say, how to, uh, how to bring whole households to Vodafone. And what is the, what is the other consequences? And the consequences are uh, manifold, honestly. Because if you really want to do it deeply and correctly and thoroughly, a lot of company processes have to change. In the beginning, it's only the marketing processes that will change. You suddenly market to households. But if you want to ingrain it deeper into the organization, KPIs change. So you look at household churn in terms of customer churn. Just as an example, the reporting changes. So household, uh, va um, household value development versus transaction value. You don't look at the single transaction, but you look at the development of your household value. And uh, services, customer operations, for example. You suddenly serve customers that formerly have been, for example, low value customers as high value customers because the uh, household as such is a high value household, right? And you want to give the same experience to the uh, ho uh, household so also the son with a prepaid phone that he, he just used to text his, his pale basically, you also treat him as a high value customer because his father spends uh, 800 euros on his postpaid, right? This is, this is the concept and it changes fundamentally. So the def definition there changes a lot and the processes need to adapt. And you also need uh, the whole area of sales need to change because they're selling to a household. So you're selling uh, um, bundles in terms of uh, SIM cards. And believe me, for salespeople, this is difficult, right? SIM card selling they are used to for ages. But selling to a household is something that is different. <coughs> so, I just saw a sign. I have something like five minutes to go, correct? Okay. Because I'm already on my last slide. <laughs> so the do's and don'ts. So let me start with the don'ts. I always start with the negative, so I have the positive at the end. Um, so a clear don't is don't compare contracts to household development. It simply doesn't exist. Obviously you think if somebody churns, then uh, I also see churn from the household. But the household is a much more complex construct. So ho as I said, households split up, uh, join, merge, and the number of households fluctuates in a totally different way than the, um, um, than the uh, single uh, contract or the single customer view. And we try to um, identify the correlation between the two. You can do it, but it's a really tough job and you don't wanna do this on a regular basis, I can guarantee you. So the other, the other thing is don't assume there's a household director, somebody who decides everything for the whole household. Again, doesn't exist. You need to identify the people within the household you need to talk to in order 
to convince the rest of the household of a certain topic. So um, that is something that you can also find out with FNA. So you, um, I have no time basically to speak about that in more detail, but this is something that you can at least uh, with a certain propensity uh, find out with FNA as well. And the third thing is don't target a person. Obviously, there is a tendency of a lot of people, again, to target persons because you have a product and you need to push it into the market, right? And your boss says basically push it in the market and you're incentivized on the, on the sales of a, of a product. But if you, again, target to a person, you mess up the whole concept, right? Because you're targeting products to a single person that it might fit to that person with that profile, but probably doesn't fit into the whole household situation and you're destroying your revenue. So this is basically some of the key learnings. There are more learnings and we can sim uh, easily discuss afterwards. Uh, I can give you a lot of more examples uh, of do's and don'ts, but I think these are more or less the key ones. And what are the do's? Um, one of the do's is obviously we're moving from, we have moved from facts-based to propensity-based. Although the propensity is quite high, 80 plus percent, probably even higher, um, we are looking at propensity-based figures. So in one out of 10 cases, the household that we see might not be our household. And you have to accommodate that in how you speak to a household, how certain you are when you speak to a household, how you target households. And um, this is something that needs a little bit of um, adaption by the marketeers within the organization. They suddenly need to have different communication style, different messaging around households. And um, this is something that you definitely need to do and this gives you um, um, some edge. Um, I talked about the second one already, ensure that you have constant, first bring it to a very high level and then ensure you have constant matching rules and constant distance metrics and all of that. Because yes, it gives you the ability to, um, to analyze um, households over time which is a very important thing. And simplify. Uh, in Germany, in particular, we have the tendency to make everything perfect. Uh, it, it's a prejudice, but uh, uh, sometimes you see it in this, uh, in this project, right? Oh, this variable has to go in, and this has to go in, and uh, we have a, even we have a term for, for this. It's called the Eierlegende Wollmichsau. So it's, uh, it's an animal that can do everything, right? It can give wool and it can, uh, can produce eggs and it uh, gives milk and everything, right? So this is something that uh, in the end uh, you shouldn't do. Start simple, four lines of business. So for example, for Vodafone, we didn't go into also adding all the entertainment products, the different entertainment offers, right? This is probably a next step where you can add to this uh, product as well. But we started with the four or five Lines of business, prepay, uh, prepay postpay, DSL, cable, fixed net, and um, yeah, that other part. So this is, this is, because it becomes complex anyway. If you are lost in all this matrix and, um, and you want to find the first model, then uh, you are very happy that you don't have a complex input environment. So, and this is for you, basically. This is a concept I introduced. And on your way home, basically, I think you fly again. POC, what I uh, just told you. Just talk to, to your fellows in the plane and see how the, how the message get around. I, um, I, uh, um, I think I'm uh, at the end of my presentation. In case you have any questions, I think we have some time for questions now, right? Yes, you have questions, and then I'll bring the mic to you. Um, here we go. Uh, the trend improvement you showed earlier, is that on an individual level or is that on a household level? Oh, it's on an individual level, otherwise you couldn't compare it, right? If, right. You, if the whole household had to churn, obviously the churn is lower. But it's churning, people churning from that household compared to individual churn. But after uh, you have identified a household and sold the product to that household, that is a household product. So people with a household product churn significantly less compared to individual customers with an individual product. So you're saying it's about stickiness because of this. My second question is, what tool do you use to do the matching? Sorry? What tool do you use to do the matching? Program between name and blob. What tool? Oh, what tool? Oh, or what, what program or yeah. whatever you use um, to do the matching? Because it's obviously the hardest part of 
doing the household matching. Yeah, uh, it, it, well, we have these two parts, right? We have the, the fuzzy match, the first step, and then we have the SNA. The SNA is done on Asta, um, because uh, Asta, uh, uh, social network analysis, the second step where you identify, for example, the hidden household members. This is done on Asta because Asta is extremely good in building networks, passes, and all this kind of stuff, right? And everybody can, can do this on Asta. And uh, the first thing is uh, we build into the ETL process because we need this information at a very early stage within the data warehouse. And uh, therefore, we uh, put it into Abinitio, which is the uh, ETL tool at Vodafone, and um, put the code there. So on the ETL process, the household information is generated and then stored in the third normal form in the um, data warehouse, in the core data warehouse. Have you, have you tried to create a process which can uh, operationally confirm the analytical results? Like I can join the accounts just to be able to service the other products for my wife or the other members in Absolutely. the family? So again, I I'd separate the two steps. The fuzzy match we just looked at. So we took a sample of the original uh, non-matched data basically, and then we um, uh, also took the results for these people. And basically we, we had some people sitting in front of the data and trying to, um, to make a tick with every result that we do. Is this the right match, right? So because a human can see it. That was for the first part. For the second part, <coughs> um, the current situation is done, we have done a panel. So we looked at the number of people that willingly gave us their, um, their household information, so which people live in the same household with them, and gave us their telephone numbers. So um, this, uh, in, this in, the first, uh, in the first step, these were Vodafone and Teradata employees. Obviously, you have a certain bias in this data because there's a lot of more business uh, talks with uh, telephony in, in this uh, two, um, in this two uh, segments. <coughs> But uh, it was good enough to show that the, this, the, the, the system really works. There's still the idea to do an external panel, so to, to go external and do this on a much larger scale. So, so with, uh, for, for the first step, we had something like 170 um, people and their household information, um, where uh, to come really be statistical relevant, you probably need a 1,000 or something like that. My question was rather related to, to the kind of matching or joining the, the contracts. Where can, when when can I, can I um, turn on some product on the different account or different contracts? So I can simply uh, switch something on the other contracts, being the member of the family. Ah. No, we don't do uh, that. Kind it of it operational. We don't do that. What we create uh, in in the core, we create much more. But what we create in the core are IDs. So we create a person ID. We create a house ID. This is mainly the address, the, the, and we create a um, household ID. So there can be more than one household in one house, right? So you see the big apartment blocks with. household ID. So there can be more than one household in one house, right? So you see the big apartment blocks with thousands of houses, some, uh, households sometimes in one house. Um, and, and this ID we basically um, put into the system and we can identify each individual customer to which household does he belong to, which house does he belong, and uh, are the two uh, records within the database, is this probably the same person? So this kind of information we create. And we don't switch contracts because this is uh, terribly complex, right? Because then you have, then you can, uh, people are allowed to cancel their contract immediately and this kind of thing. So, so don't go there. There's no need to go there. Okay. I guess this is the last question. Okay. Are you going to be available? I, I will be, yeah. Okay. Um, there is a inconsistency in the material. I'd like you to elaborate a little uh, a little bit. Uh, you said that a household is propensity based, so you are never 100% sure that yes. the household was uh, identified correctly. And on the last slide, you said that we should not be looking for a director or we shouldn't be contacting yes. a person. So yes. I'd like you to, uh, since you are never sure whether the household is the household. Yeah, but do you have to, to be? To the do you have to be sure if you're in? Uh, if you're 90% correct as a marketeer, I think, I think that's good enough, honestly. 
And uh, if you know, uh, because uh, honestly, if you look at current marketing campaigns, they are less than, uh, uh, significantly less than 90% correct. And uh, uh, so, so this is a big improvement from that perspective. And if you have identified it, let's look at the 90% and assume this 90% are correct. That's then within this 90%, everything I said is consistent. For the 10%, you're absolutely right. That's, that's only a question uh, whether we accept the 10% of potential um, yes. errors. You, you simply accept it because marketing is not a precise, uh, yeah, it's not I a do. precise profession. I'm from sales. <laughs> you're from sales. That, that's a different one, right? You are very precise. At least when it comes to bonus and things, uh, but that's other story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, let's all give uh, Stefan a round of applause, and uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Good. Yeah, sure.